Tonight's video is brought to you by Chill Frog CBD. Chill Frog CBD is providing the most effective, highest value products to help people responsibly and naturally find their chill in this incredibly stressful world. Everything you purchase from Chill Frog CBD is organic, premium quality ingredients made in the USA with things sourced from the USA as well. It's also an incredibly good value, and it's incredibly accessible to those who haven't tried it yet. And if you're nervous about it, Chill Frog makes it very approachable with simple and clear explanations with every order. If it sounds like something you're interested in or just want to try, check out the link at the top of the description and then use code DAVIS30 for 30% off your entire order. And find your chill with Chill Frog CBD. Thanks for the sponsor. And thank you all for listening. It's a convention, said Anthony Carling cheerfully, and not a very convincing one. Time, indeed. There's no such thing as time, really. It has no actual existence. Time is nothing more than an infinitesimal point in eternity, just as space is an infinitesimal point in infinity. At the most, time is sort of a tunnel through which we are accustomed to believe that we are traveling. There's a roar in our ears and a darkness in our eyes which makes it seem real to us. But before we came into the tunnel, we existed forever in an infinite sunlight, and after we've got through it, we shall exist in an infinite sunlight again. So why should we bother ourselves about the confusion and noise and darkness which only encompasses us for a moment? For a firm rooted believer in such immeasurable ideas as these, which he punctuated with brisk application of the poker to the brave sparkling glow of the fire, Anthony has a very pleasant appreciation of the measurable and the finite, and nobody with whom I have acquaintance has so keen a zest for life and its enjoyments as he. He had given us this evening an admirable dinner, had passed round a port beyond praise, and had illuminated the jolly hours with the light of his infectious optimism. Now the small company had melted away. I was left with him over the fire in his study. Outside, the tattoo of wind-driven sleet was audible on the window panes, overscoring now and again the flap of the flames on the open hearth, and the thought of the chilly blasts and the snow-covered pavement in Brompton Square across which two skidding taxicabs, the last of his guests, had scurried, made my position resident here till tomorrow morning the more delicately delightful. Above all, there was this stimulating and suggestive companion who, whether he talked of the great abstractions which were so intensely real and practical to him, or the very remarkable experiences which he had encountered among these conventions of time and space, was equally fascinating to the listener. I adore life, he said. I find it the most entrancing plaything. It's a delightful game, and as you know very well, the only conceivable way to play a game is to treat it extremely seriously. If you say to yourself, it's only a game, you cease to take the slightest interest in it. You have to know that it's only a game, and behave as if it was the one object of existence. I should like it to go on for many years yet, but all the time one has to be living on the true plane as well, which is eternity and infinity. If you come to think of it, the one thing which the human mind cannot grasp is the finite, not the infinite, the temporary, not the eternal. <laughs> that sounds rather paradoxical, said I. Only because you've made a habit of thinking about things that seem bounded and limited. Look it in the face for a minute. Try to imagine finite time and space, and you find you can't. Go back a million years, and multiply that million of years by another million, and you find that you can't conceive a beginning. What happened before that beginning? Another beginning, and another beginning? And before that? Look at it like that, and you find that the only solution comprehensible to you is the existence of an eternity, something that never began and will never end. It's the same about space. Project yourself to the farthest star, and what comes beyond that? Emptiness? Go on through the emptiness, and you can't imagine it being finite and having an end. It must needs to go on forever. 
That's the only thing you can understand. There's no such thing as before or after or beginning or end, and what a comfort that is. I should fidget myself to death if there wasn't a huge soft cushion of eternity to lean one's head against. Some people say, I believe I've heard you say it yourself, that the idea of eternity is so tiring, you feel that you want it to stop. But that's because you're thinking of eternity in terms of time and mumbling your brain. And after that, and after that, don't you grasp the idea that in eternity there isn't after any more than there is any before? It's all one. Eternity isn't a quantity. It's quality. Sometimes when Anthony talks in this manner, I seem to get a glimpse of that which is his mind, and is so transparently clear and solidly real. At other times, not having a brain that repeatedly envisages abstractions, I feel as though he was pushing me over a precipice, and my intellectual faculties grasp wildly at anything tangible or comprehensible. This was the case now, and I hastily interrupted. But there is a before and after, I said. A few hours ago, you gave us an admirable dinner, and after that, yes, after, we played bridge. And now you're going to explain things a little more clearly to me, and after that, I shall go to bed. He laughed. <laughs> you shall do exactly as you like, he said, and you shan't be a slave to time either, tonight or tomorrow morning. We won't even mention an hour for breakfast, but you shall have it in eternity whenever you awake. And as I see it is not midnight yet, we'll slip the bonds of time and talk quite infinitely. I'll stop the clock if that will assist you in getting rid of your illusion, and then I'll tell you a story, which to my mind shows how unreal so-called realities are, or at any rate, how fallacious our senses as judges of what is real and what is not. Something occult, something spookish, I asked, pricking up my ears, for Anthony has the strangest clairvoyances and visions of things unseen by the normal eye. I suppose you might call some of it occult, he said, though there's a certain amount of rather grim reality mixed into it. Go on. Excellent mixture, said I. He threw a fresh log on the fire. It's a longish story, he said. You may stop me as soon as you've had enough, but there will come a point for which I claim your consideration. You, who cling to your before and after, has it ever occurred to you how difficult it is to say when an incident takes place? Say that a man commits some crime of violence. Can we not, with a good deal of truth, say that he really commits that crime when he definitely plans and determines upon it, dwelling on it with gusto? The actual commission of it, I think we can reasonably argue, is the mere material sequel of his resolve. He is guilty of it when he makes that determination. When, therefore, in the term of before and after, does the crime truly take place? There is also in my story a further point of for your consideration. For it seems certain that the spirit of a man, after the death of his body, is obliged to reenact such a crime with a view, I suppose we may guess, to his remorse and his eventual redemption. Those who have second sight have seen such reenactments. Perhaps he may have done his deed blindly in this life, but then his spirit recommits it with its spiritual eyes open and able to comprehend its enormity. So, shall we view the man's original determination and the material commission of his crime only as preludes to the real commission of it, when with eyes unsealed he does it and repents of it. That all sounds very obscure when I speak in the abstract, but I think you'll see what I mean if you follow my tale. Comfortable? Got everything you want? Here goes, then. He leaned back in his chair, concentrating his mind, and then spoke. The story that I'm about to tell you, he said, had its beginning a month ago when you were away in Switzerland. It reached its conclusion, so I imagine, last night. I do not at any rate expect to experience any more of it. Well, a month ago I was returning late on a very wet night from dining out. There was not a taxi to be had, and I hurried through the pouring rain to the tube station at Piccadilly Circus, and thought myself very lucky to catch the last train in that direction. 
The carriage in which I stepped was quite empty except for another passenger who sat next to the door immediately opposite of me. I had never, to my knowledge, seen him before, but I found my attention vividly fixed on him, as if he somehow concerned me. He was a man of middle age, in dress clothes, and his face wore an expression of intense thought, as if in his mind he was pondering something very significant, and his hand, which was resting on his knee, clenched and unclenched itself. Suddenly he looked up at me and stared me in the face, and I saw there suspicion and fear, as if I had surprised him in some secret deed. At that moment we stopped at Dover Street, and the conductor threw open the doors, announced the station, and added, Change here for Hyde Park Corner and Gloucester Road. That was all right for me, since it meant that the train would stop at Brompton Road, which was my destination. It was all right, apparently, too, for my companion, for he certainly did not get out, and after a moment's stop, during which no one else got in, we went on. I saw him, I must insist, after the doors were closed and the train had started. But when I looked again, as we rattled on, I saw that there was no one there. I was quite alone in the carriage. Now you may think that I had one of those swift momentary dreams which flash in and out of the mind and space of a second, but I did not believe it was so myself, for I felt that I had experienced some sort of premonition or clairvoyant vision. A man, the semblance of whom, astral body or whatever you may choose to call it, I had just seen, would sometimes sit in that seat opposite to me, pondering and planning. But why? I asked. Why should it have been the astral body of a living man which you thought you had seen? Why not the ghost of a dead one? Because of my own sensations. The sight of the spirits of someone dead, which has occurred to me two or three times in my life, has always been accompanied by physical shrinking and fear, and by the sensation of cold and loneliness. I believed, at any rate, that I had seen a phantom of the living, and that impression was confirmed, I might say, proved the next day. For I met the man himself, and the next night, as you shall hear, I met the phantom again. We will take them in order. I was lunching then the next day with my neighbor, Mrs. Stanley. There was a small party, and when I arrived we waited but for the final guest. He entered while I was talking to some friend, and... Presently, at my elbow, I heard Mrs. Stanley's voice. Let me introduce you to Sir Henry Pale, she said. I turned and saw my vis-a-vis -vis of the night before. It was quite unmistakably he, and as we shook hands, he looked at me, I thought with vague and puzzled recognition. Haven't we met before, Mr. Carling, he said. I seem to recollect. For the moment, I forgot the strange manner of his disappearance from the carriage and thought it had been the man himself whom I'd seen that night. Surely, and not so long ago, I said, for we sat opposite each other in the last tube train from Piccadilly Circus yesterday night. He still looked at me, frowning, puzzled, and shook his head. That can hardly be, he said. I only came out from the country this morning. Now, this interested me profoundly, for the astral body, we are told, abides in some half-conscious region of the mind or spirit, and has recollections of what has happened to it, which it can convey only very vaguely and dimly to the conscious mind. All lunchtime I could see his eyes again and again directed to me with the same puzzled and perplexed air, and as I was taking my departure, he came up to me. I shall recollect some day, he said, where we met before and I hope we may meet again. Was it not? And he stopped. No, it is gone from me, he added. The log that Anthony had thrown on the fire was burning bravely now, and its high flickering flame lit up his face. No, I don't know whether you believe in coincidences as chance things, he said, but if you do, get rid of the notion. Or, if you can't at once, call it a coincidence that very night again I caught the last train on the tube going westward. This time, so far from my being a solitary passenger, there was a considerable crowd waiting at Dover Street, where I entered, and just as the noise of the approaching train began to reverberate in the tunnel, I caught sight of Sir Henry Pale, standing near the opening 
from which the train would presently emerge, apart from the rest of the crowd. And I thought to myself how odd it was that I should have seen the phantom of him at this very hour last night and the man himself now, and I began walking toward him with the idea of saying, Anyhow, is it in the tube that we meet tonight? Then a terrible and awful thing happened. Just as the train emerged from the tunnel, he jumped down onto the line in front of it, and the train swept along over him, up the platform. For a moment I was stricken with horror at the sight, and I remember covering my eyes against the dreadful tragedy. But then I perceived that, though it had taken place in full sight of those who were waiting, no one seemed to have seen it except myself. The driver, looking out from his window, had not applied his brakes. There was no jolt from the advancing train, no scream, no cry, and the rest of the passengers began boarding the train with perfect nonchalance. I must have staggered, for I felt sick and faint with what I had seen, and some kindly soul put his arm around me and supported me onto the train. He was a doctor, he told me, and asked if I was in pain or what ailed me. I told him what I thought I'd seen, and he assured me that no such accident had taken place. It was clear then, to my own mind, that I'd seen the second act, so to speak, in this physical drama, and I pondered next morning over the problem as to what I should do. Already I'd glanced at the morning paper, which, as I knew would be the case, contained no mention whatever of what I'd seen. The thing had certainly not happened, but I knew in myself that it would happen. The flimsy veil of time had been withdrawn from my eyes, and I'd seen into what you call the future. In terms of time, of course, it was the future. But from my point of view, the thing was just as much in the past as it was in the future. It existed and waited only for its material fulfillment. The more I thought about it, the more I saw that I could do nothing. I interrupted his narrative. You did nothing, I exclaimed. Surely you might have taken some step in order to try and avert the tragedy. He shook his head. What step precisely, he said. Was I to go to Sir Henry and tell him that once more I'd seen him in the tube in the act of committing suicide? Look at it like this. Either what I had seen was pure illusion, pure imagination, in which case it had no existence or significance at all, or it was actual and real, and essentially it had happened. Or take it, though, not very logically, somewhere between the two. Say that the idea of suicide, for some cause of which I knew nothing, had occurred to him or would occur. Should I not, if that was the case, be doing a very dangerous thing by making such a suggestion to him? Might not the fact of my telling him what I'd seen put the idea into his mind, or, if it was already there, confirm it and then strengthen it? It's a ticklish matter to play with souls, as Browning says. But it seems so... Inhuman not to interfere in any way, said I, not to make any attempt. What interference? asked he. What attempt? The human instinct in me still seemed to cry aloud at the thought of doing nothing to avert such a tragedy, but it seemed to be beating itself against something austere or inexorable. And cudgel my brain as I would, I could not combat the sense of what he had said. I had no answer for him. And he went on. You must recollect, too, he said, that I believed then, and I believe now, that the thing had happened. The cause of it, whatever that was, had begun to work, and the effect in the material sphere was inevitable. That is what I alluded to when, at the beginning of my story, I asked you to consider how difficult it was to say when an action took place. You still hold that this particular action, this suicide of Sir Henry, had not yet taken place, because he had not yet thrown himself under the advancing train. To me, that seems a materialistic view. I hold that in all but the endorsement of it, so to speak, it had taken place. I fancy that Sir Henry, for instance, now free from the material dusks, knows that himself. 
Exactly as he spoke, there swept the warm lit room a current of cold air. Roughly my hairs had passed me, making the wood flames on the hearth dwindle and flare. I looked round to see if the door at my back had opened, but nothing stirred there, and over the closed window the curtains were fully drawn. As it reached Anthony, he sat up quickly in his chair and directed his glance this way and that about the room. Did you feel that? he asked. Yes, a sudden draught, I said. Ice cold. Anything else? he asked. Any other sensation? I paused before I answered, for at the moment there occurred to me Anthony's differentiation of the effects produced on the beholder by a phantasm of the living and the apparition of the dead. It was the latter which accurately described my sensation now, a certain physical shrinking, a fear, a feeling of desolation. But yet I'd seen nothing. It felt rather creepy, I said. As I spoke, I drew my chair rather closer to the fire and sent a swift, and I confess, a somewhat apprehensive scrutiny round the walls of the brightly lit room. I noticed at the same time that Anthony was peering across to the chimney piece on which, just below a sconce holding two electric lights, stood the clock which at the beginning of our talk he'd offered to stop. The hands I noticed pointed to twenty-five minutes to one. But you saw nothing, he asked. Nothing whatsoever, I said. Oh, why should I? What was there to see, or did you... I don't think so, he said. Somehow this answer got on my nerves, for the queer feeling which had accompanied that cold current of air had not left me. If anything, it had become more acute. But surely you know whether you saw anything or not, I said. One can't always be certain, said he. I say that I don't think I saw anything, but I'm not sure, either, whether the story I'm telling you was quite concluded last night. I think there may be a further incident. If you prefer it, I will leave the rest of it, as far as I know it, unfinished till tomorrow morning, and you can go off to bed now. His complete calmness and tranquility reassured me. But why should I do that? I asked. Again he looked around on the bright walls. Well, I think something entered the room just now, he said, and it may develop. If you don't like the notion, you had better go. Of course, there's nothing to be alarmed at. Whatever it is, it can't hurt us. But it is close on the hour when the two successive nights I saw what I have already told you, and an apparition usually occurs at the same time. Why is that so, I cannot say, but certainly it looks as if a spirit that is earthbound is still subject to certain conventions, the conventions of time, for instance. I think that personally I shall see something before long, but most likely you won't. You're not such a sufferer as I from these... these delusions. I was frightened and knew it, but I was also intensely interested in some perverse pride wriggled within me at his last words. Why, so I asked myself, shouldn't I see whatever was to be seen? I don't want to go in the least, I said. I want to hear the rest of your story. <sighs> Where was I then? Mm, yes, you were wondering why I didn't do something after I saw the train move up to the platform, and I said that there was nothing to be done. If you think it over, I fancy you will agree with me. A couple of days passed, and on the third morning I saw in the paper that there had come fulfillment to my vision. Sir Henry Pale, who had been waiting on the platform of Dover Street Station for the last train to South Kensington, had thrown himself in front of it as it came into the station. The train had been pulled up in a couple of yards, but a wheel had passed over his chest, crushing it in and instantly killing him. An inquest was held, and there emerged at it one of the dark stories which, on occasions like these, sometimes fall like a midnight shadow across a life that the world perhaps had thought prosperous. He had long been on bad terms with his wife, from whom he had lived apart, and it appeared that not long before this, he had fallen desperately in love with another woman. 
The night before his suicide, he had appeared very late at his wife's house and had a long, angry scene with her in which he had entreated her to divorce him, threatening otherwise to make her life hell to her. She refused, and in an ungovernable fit of passion, he attempted to strangle her. There was a struggle, and the noise of it caused her manservant to come up, who succeeded in overmastering him. Lady Pyle threatened to proceed against him for assault with the intention to murder her. With this hanging over his head, the next night, as I have already told you, he committed suicide. He glanced at the clock again, and I saw that the hands now pointed to ten minutes to one. The fire was beginning to burn low, and the room surely was growing strangely cold. That's not quite all, said Anthony, again looking around. Are you sure you wouldn't prefer to hear it tomorrow? The mixture of shame and pride and curiosity again prevailed. No. Tell me the rest of it at once, I said. Before speaking, he peers suddenly at some point behind my chair, shading his eyes. I followed his glance and knew what he meant by saying that sometimes one could not be sure whether one saw something or not. But was that an outlined shadow that intervened between me and the wall? It was difficult to focus. I did not know whether it was near the wall or near my chair. It seemed too clear away, anyhow, as I looked more closely at it. You see nothing? asked Anthony. No. I don't think so, said I. And you? I think I do, he said, and his eyes followed something which was invisible to mine. They came to rest between him and the chimney piece. Looking steadily there, he spoke again. All this happened some weeks ago, he said, when you were out in Switzerland, and since then, up until last night, I saw nothing further. But all that time, I was expecting something further. I felt that, as far as I was concerned, it was not all over yet, and last night, with the intention of assisting any communication to come through to me from, from beyond, I went into the Dover Street tube station a few minutes before one o'clock, the hour at which both the assault and the suicide had taken place. The platform, when I arrived on it, was absolutely empty, or appeared to be so. Presently, just as I began to hear the roar of the approaching train, I saw there was a figure of a man standing some twenty yards from me, looking into the tunnel. He had not come down with me in the lift, and the moments before, he had not been there. He began moving toward me, and then I saw who it was, and I felt a stir of wind, icy cold, coming toward me as he approached. It was not the draught that heralds the approach of a train, for it came from the opposite direction. He came close up to me, and I saw there was recognition in his eyes. He raised his face towards me, and I saw his lips move, but perhaps in the increasing noise from the tunnel, I heard nothing come from them. He put out his hand as if entreating me to do something, and I, with a cowardice from which I cannot forgive myself, I shrank from him, for I knew, by the sign that I have told you, that this was one from the dead, and my flesh quaked before him, drowning for the moment all pity and all desire to help him if that was possible. Certainly he had something which he wanted of me, but I recoiled from him. And by now the train was emerging from the tunnel, and the next moment, with a dreadful gesture of despair, he threw himself out in front of it. As he finished speaking, he got up quickly from his chair, still looking fixedly in front of him. I saw his pupils dilate and his mouth worked. It's coming he said. I am to be given a chance of atoning for my cowardice. There's nothing to be afraid of. I must remember that myself. As he spoke, there came from the paneling above, the chimney piece, one loud shattering crack, and the cold wind again circled about my head. 
I found myself shrinking back in my chair with my hands held in front of me as instinctively I screened myself against something which I knew was there, but which I could not see. Every sense told me that there was a presence in the room other than mine, and Anthony's, and the horror of that was that I could not see it. Any vision, however terrible, would, I felt, be more tolerable than this clear, certain knowledge that close to me was this invisible thing. And yet what horror might not be disclosed of the face of the dead and the crushed chest? But all I could see as I shuddered in this cold wind was the familiar walls of the room, and Anthony standing in front of me, stiff and firm, making, as I knew, a call on his courage. His eyes were focused on something quite close to him, and some semblance of a smile quivered on his mouth. And then he spoke again. Yes, I know you, he said, and you want something of me. Tell me then what it is. There was absolute silence, but what was silence to my ears could not have been so to his, for once or twice he nodded, and once he said, Yes. I see. I will do it. And with the knowledge that even as there was someone here whom I could not see, so there was speech going on that I could not hear, this terror of the dead and the unknown rose in me with the sense of powerlessness to move that accompanies the nightmare. I could not stir. I could not speak. I could only strain my ears far from the inaudible my eyes for the unseen while the cold wind from the very valley of the shadow of death streamed over me. It was not the presence of death itself that was terrible. It was that from its tranquility and serene keeping there had been driven some unquiet soul unable to rest in peace for whatever ultimate awakening rouses the countless generations of those who have passed away, driven no less from whatever activities are theirs back into the material world from which it should have been delivered. Never until the gulf between the living and the dead was thus bridged had it seemed so immense and so unnatural. It is possible that the dead may have communication with the living, and it was not that exactly that so terrified me, for such communication as we know it comes voluntarily for them. But here was something icy cold and crime-laden that was chased back from the peace that would not pacify it. And then, most horrible of all, there came a change in these unseen conditions. Anthony was silent now, and from looking straight ahead, fixedly in front of him, he began to glance sideways to where I sat and back again. And with that, I felt the unseen presence had turned its attention from him to me. And now, too, gradually, by awful degrees, I began to see... There came an outline of shadow across the chimney piece and the panels above it. It took shape, it fashioned itself in the outline of a man. Within the shape of the shadows, details began to form themselves, and I saw, wavering in the air like something concealed by haze, the semblance of a face stricken and tragic and burdened with such a weight of woe as no human face had ever worn. Next, the shoulders outlined themselves, and a stain, livid and red, spread out below them, and suddenly the vision leaped into clearness. There he stood, the chest crushed in and drowned in the red stain from which broken ribs like the bones of a wrecked ship protruded. The mournful, terrible eyes were fixed on me, and it was from then so I knew that the bitter wind proceeded. And quick as the switching off of a lamp, the specter vanished. And the bitter wind was still, and opposite to me stood Anthony in a quiet, bright-lit room. There was no sense of an unseen presence any more. He and I were then alone, with an interrupted conversation still dangling between us in the warm air. I came around to that, as one comes round after an anesthetic. It all swam in sight again, unreal at first and gradually assuming the texture of actuality. You were talking to someone, not me, I said. Who was it? 
What was it? He passed the back of his hand over his forehead, which glistened in the light. A soul in hell, he said. Now it is hard to ever recall a mere physical sensation when they have passed. If you have been cold and are warmed, it is difficult to remember what cold was like. If you have been hot and have gotten cool, it is difficult to realize what the oppression of heat really meant. Just so, with the passing of that presence, I found myself unable to recapture the sense of terror with which, a few moments ago, had invaded and inspired me. A soul in hell, I said. What are you talking about? He moved about the room for a minute or so, and then came and sat on the arm of my chair. I don't know what you saw, he said, or what you felt. But there has never in all my life happened to me anything more real than what these last few minutes have brought. I have talked to a soul in the hell of remorse, which is the only possible hell. He knew from what happened last night that he could perhaps establish communication through me with the world he had quitted, and he sought me and found me. I am charged with a mission to a woman. I have never seen a message from the contrite. You can guess who it is. He got up with a sudden briskness. Let's verify it anyhow, he said. He gave me the street and the number. Ah, there's a telephone book. Would it be a coincidence merely if I found that at number 20 in Chase Morse Street, South Kensington, there lived a lady pale? He turned over the leaves with the bulky volume. Yes, that's right, he said. everyone. I hope you enjoyed tonight's story. I know we've been doing more than one here lately, but I felt like this one stood really well on its own. It's one of the most interesting stories I've read on the channel in a long time, and it has a certain way about it that's just really fun and interesting to read. Um, let me know what you think about it in the comment section down below because it definitely kind of made me feel a certain type of way. It made me think about time and even like death and I guess before birth, if you want to call it that. It made me think about that, which I think it was supposed to. It was almost not necessarily existential, but it definitely made you think about what was here before us, what will be here after us, and even what's here now, you know. It was a really interesting read. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and like I said, I hope you all did as well. So while you're down there, go ahead and let me know what you thought of the story. And while you're doing that, I will give a quick thank you to all of our $5 patrons and members. Thank you to Absinthe Alice, Amethyst, Amet, Ann Barry, Bubbly Panda, Caroline, Christina Smith, CT, Deborah Tychus, Elizabeth Watkins, LSG, Frankie Brockway, Furious Weasel, Even Doubt Blood Out, Jennifer Dameron, Jesse Jess Jess, Justinia Zoromsky, Karen Parrott, Kat, Kathy Flanning, Laura, Lindsay Pruitt, Melody Evans, Melissa Berwick, Mindy Bannon, Moon Potato, Nicholas Moore, Nora, Nova Nocturne, Patricia Rodea, PJ Masks, Ray Clegg, Sentinel, Theno on Gum 24, Tiger Princess, Tish Love, Triumph and Victoria Step. Thank you all for the amazing continued support. I hope you all have a wonderful day, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. And let me know in the comment section below which story you'd like to hear next. It can be a public domain story. It can be a story you read on No Sleep and you want me to narrate here. Let me know. I'll keep an eye out for all your answers and I'll see what we can do. Thanks again everyone for listening. Take care of yourselves and everyone around you. Good night, everyone.